I am pumped about what God's given me to give to you today. And uh, I want to give you uh, some encouragement. Last Sunday um, was our first worship experience in uh, Lincoln Learning Center there in El Reno, Discovery El Reno. Uh, we will be, uh, our grand opening is February 4th, and I want you to be in prayer with us. We're in a 21-day uh, time of prayer and fasting. And uh, whatever God lays in your heart, I've gotten texts this week, Pastor, dairy is it considered a meat? And, and what kind of uh, nuts or vegetables am I, am I to refrain from? This is not something where I'm going to send out a list and say you have to follow this. And the Daniel fast, uh, you can do a little bit of research, but whatever God directs you to, the most important time, the most important time, I believe, of 2024 is to give God our first fruits that means the very first part of the year to him, seeking him, doesn't mean that we put him in a, on a shelf after this. It means we're saying, God, you're first in my life. And so I want you to pray with us. February 4th is going to be an incredible time. Last Sunday, uh, it is really helpful, helpful for us and our team because they're loading the trailer, they're unloading the trailer, they're making sure everything's going good. Last Sunday, we were expecting just about, our team is about 45 to 50. They had almost 90 people last week, people from El Reno. That's wonderful. That's awesome. I know that, and that you know, I believe God is going to far exceed our expectations. And, um, and I'm just going to say this in faith. I'm believing for God to give us some land. I've gotten three calls this, this last week of people saying this land is available, this land is available, and, and, and we're going to look at that. But most importantly, I'm going to believe God for, uh, I, I, personally, I do not want to borrow funds. I don't want to borrow any money. I, I just believe if there's a, if there's a need, God, God can meet that need. But I want you to be praying with me for, most importantly, for people to be saved. Last week, we, we talked about goals, 1,000 people to be saved at both our central campus and at El Reno, and for 1,000 people to be baptized. I talked about 80%. We want 80% of our church to tithe, and, um, and maybe our, our church is changing, so what people would physically give in an offering uh, is now a lot of digital. You can go to discoveryokc.org and give. But let me tell you, if you really want your home to be blessed— Tithe. Put God first in your finances. Well, I say, I love Jesus. Well, let's honor the Lord with the giving him of our first fruits of our increase. That's our tithe, okay? And then I ask you to, to be faithful, to be, uh, to be fed. And that's just not on a Sunday morning, but that's feeding yourself daily. But that's also discipleship groups coming forward. And on Wednesday night, we have other opportunities throughout the weeks. But we have an incredible uh, marriage class. We have a sanctuary class. We have, Pastor, we have Kendall Dillon, we have Gary Rogers, we have uh, Pastor Gary Rogers, we have um, Justin Matisa, we have all kinds of things going on tonight. That's going to, we have Sunday evening classes, we're going to uh, dismiss those tonight because of the weather, and, um, uh, but I want you to look for any and every opportunity, you go to our website and find those things, and let's uh, just, just seek the Lord, put Him first, and I can tell you, we need each other. This is not doomsday. I'm just telling you, 2024, I believe, is going to be the craziest year ever. And the Lord, in fact, has been dealing with me. In fact, I heard our general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, Doug Clay, we were in meetings this past week in uh, Wachahatchee, Texas. And he said uh, one of the things God's teaching him is there is a famine uh, for the Word of God. And, and the famine is about the truth is not being taught. And, and I, I want to, to do my best, and when I stand before you, and always have a word from God to give you, but also to understand we're not going to water down the truth. Amen. Someone stands behind this desk, someone stands behind, and they are approved. They are, that we've vetted them, we've, 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 we, we know them. The Bible says you're to know those that minister among you. Uh, they're going to speak truth in love, and they're going to uh, tell you the whole counsel of the word of God, not just the things that they like or that you'll like, okay? So uh, I really believe that it's very important for us to understand the first part of this year. So today, I, I wanna talk to you about baggage. I wanna talk to you about baggage claim. We're gonna look at Exodus chapter three, begin reading in verse one in just a moment. Let me kind of set the tone, let me set the uh, foundation for what the word of God 
uh, that he has given me to give to you today. Uh, last week I talked about our 29 year anniversary. We went out of town. We took uh, uh, Martha's new Nissan Pathfinder and some of you have already heard. Uh, we were, uh, had to move. I was driving um, and we had to move, change lanes and we had to physically stop on a service road and a car hit us. We were stopped, 50 mile an hour, hit the back of our car. And it, but it's all good. It, it's, it's all good. It rains on the just and the unjust. It, it's all God. And, and at first we were like, you know, and, and I, I got out. I really felt necessary for me to go pray with the lady. Uh, she was not very um, coherent with her speech. And, but God had a plan. And I believe with all my heart that God is going to somehow use this for his glory. In fact, coming back, you know, Martha's like, well, what's the process? I'd already talked to insurance. She didn't have insurance at first. Later we found out she did have insurance. She was at fault. All those things worked out. But I really believe, I told Martha, I said, I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know, when, I don't know in what fashion or way, but God's going to work this for his good. And, and I'm not just telling you this because I'm your pastor, because I'm your teacher, I'm speaking right now. It's because I really believe it. Because I, I have looked back and, and seen how faithful God has been over the years. Amen. Amen? And so uh, this was uh, something. Just pray for my wife, though. She, she, she loves her green Nissan Pathfinder so much so that she named her Fiona. <laughs> if you've watched Shrek, you know, you know she, and, and seriously, she's like, in fact, one day she texted me. She says, uh, I left my jacket at, at home. I would normally not, I would just stay at church and turn the heater up higher. She says, but I love to drive my car so much. I'm going to drive home and get my coat. And, and so I responded, you are messed up, you know. <laughs> I wish you loved me as much as your car. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, she's like, the second day, we didn't even, it was detailed when we bought it. The second day, I think I need to wash it before we leave. And I need washed, you know, it's all good. And so if you want to see the, the result of our accident, she's parked over here. It doesn't look that good, and, uh, but it doesn't look that bad either. It's all good. So I want us to, to um, talk about baggage this morning and baggage claim. You've been to the airport before, and, and you know that after you get off your flight, you go to baggage claim. And our, we don't <laughs> invest a whole lot of money in our baggage. Um, in fact, this is the best that I could find, and so this isn't good. One of them has three wheels, and, it, and it's just, yeah, it's just not that good. But uh, just, just hear me out. Our sons have trashed them over the years going to trips and so forth, and, and, and so uh, a couple years ago, I was flying by myself on a trip, and I came back, and, and this guy I got in the know on the plane. He's like, um, we're walking and talking, and we found out we knew people that we, they were in common, and, and he's, he said, well, you're going to the same place I am. And yeah, we're going to baggage claim. And I see all these bags, you know, Gucci and all these other kinds, just really nice. And, and he said, well, where's your bag? And it's the only one on the conveyor belt. <laughs> but it was trashed. And I'm like, there's my bag. And he just kind of, that's your bag? And I'm like, yeah, that's my bag. Um, all of us are carrying baggage. And... The question is, what's in your bag? And, and I want us to understand, going into this next year, there's some things we need to let go of. In order for us to mature and grow and, and have success and, and, and see God do great things, we got to let go of some of this baggage we're carrying because it's weighing us down. It's keeping us from becoming what Christ wants us to become. Hebrews chapter 12 said, Therefore, seeing we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw aside all the weights and the things that can so easily beset us. So I want you to be thinking and allow the Holy Spirit to deal with you this morning. What is it that you're carrying that you, you shouldn't be carrying? Maybe it's something from your past from a long time ago. Maybe it's a hurt, a heartache, abuse that you just, you just can't let go of. You can't in yourself let go of it, but I want you to know God's grace is bigger. And His Holy Spirit can give you uh, the strength that you can finally let go of that baggage. You know, through, throughout time, and, and especially the Word of God, I love the transparency and the, the relevance of the Word of God. There are many people that had baggage, and God worked His Spirit in them and through them to do great things. 
You think about the baggage of David. David was a, was a man after God's own heart, but David committed adultery with, with Bathsheba. Awful. You think that, that's enough. Well, he even went so far to have her husband, Uriah, killed. You think about the baggage of Rahab. Rahab was, she is listed in the genealogy of Christ, but yet she owned a brothel. It's baggage. You, you think about Jacob had a baggage because Jacob was a liar, a deceiver, a subplanner, but God said, I want to make you the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then Joseph was, he thought he was dead. In Genesis chapter 27, Jacob refused to be comforted because his son he thought was dead. Years later, he found out he was alive. So he had this baggage that he carried around every day of mourning. He wouldn't allow anybody to help him. And I wonder how many people just go through life, believers, carrying bags, all the while Jesus said, take my yoke upon, it, upon you, for it's light and easy. Cast all your care and your weight upon me. So I want to challenge you this morning as we go through this study, go through this time. What is it that's weighing you down? What kind of baggage do you have that you're carrying? And some of you have carried it for so long, it's just become a part of who you are. And there's not a day that goes to go by that you don't think about it. That's not how God wants you to live. God wants you to live in freedom. God wants you to live in joy. In spite of your circumstances, God wants you to experience the freedom that's found in letting go of the bags. So, Exodus chapter 3, we're going to read just 10 verses. Moses, if he could tell us of, of the bags that he had, you know, just for reference sake, Joseph, Moses was, was, was placed in the, in the, in the river Nile, remember, all, the, bales, all the, ba- the babies that were born male, two years of age or younger, younger were going to be killed. Well, Jochebed, Moses' mother, made this little boat, if you will, and the Pharaoh's daughter found it, and, and, and she was able to, to nurse him, to teach him the things of God for a short period of time. And then Moses was raised in Pharaoh's courts, had an incredible opportunity to learn and, and glean uh, the, the, the greatest insight and, and teachings of that day um, until he was 40. And that's when he killed an Egyptian who was mistreating an Israelite. And so he was a murderer. And then he flees. He leaves to Midian. And there he meets his wife and his wife's name uh, his, her, so his father's name was Jethro. So at this point, Moses is about 80 years old. Okay? Verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Think about how far he's fallen. How he must have been so humbled. He used to live in the courts, in the house, and the, the palaces of Pharaoh. Could have been the next king of Egypt. So he's tending the flock of Jethro, his father, and all the priests of Midian. He led the, the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There an angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from, a, from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire, but it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. It wasn't strange to see a bush on fire in the desert. What was strange was the bush was not being consumed by the fire. Why the bush does not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over the look, God called to him within the bush, Moses, Moses, Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I'm concerned about their sufferings. So I have come down to rescue them from the land of and from the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up to the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Verse 10, so now go. I am sending you 
to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, up out of Egypt. Father, thank you for your word and ask God that you would help me over the next 20, 25 minutes to share what you and you alone have given me to share. And God, I pray that you would just help us to, God, just to be real and to be honest, transparent, and receive and then respond to the word that you give today. And we'll give you thanks and ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to talk to you about five bags in this story that, that, that Moses claimed, but he needed to let go. The first baggage is simply found in chapter 3 and verse 11. We stopped at verse 10. God said, now go. I am sending you back to Egypt from which you came. You're going to be my representative before Pharaoh. And listen to the the response that Moses gives God. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God goes on to say, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to show you great signs, and I'm going to use you in incredible ways. But Moses' response was, but who am I? You see, all of us in this room, those that are watching online, everybody in this world are some total of what people have said about us, what people have done to us, and how we respond as a result. Moses was a byproduct of what his thinking is and was, and, and how that it had altered and changed over the years about what people said and how people had treated him. And, and then he had an idea of who he was. His response to God was, but who am I? If you've been mistreated, if you've been hurt, and all of us have, if you've been abused, that weight that you're carrying around determines your, your identity. And that's why some people so struggle to, to, to have a, a, a good understanding of who they are. That's why people turn to, to all kinds of things to self-medicate and try to figure out who. They, you've heard the phrase, I need to go find who I am. I, I'm searching. I'm looking. That, that's why, like never before, people are saying, well, am I really male? Am I really female? I think it's simply the fact that people don't know who they are. Because people have told them this thing, and other people have told them this thing, and they're struggling with who they really are as a person. And so they're, they're looking to somebody just to confirm, yes, you are that person. They're looking for someone to give them affirmation. And, and all the while, they really don't know who they are. I don't know if you've ever been in a, in a, in a place where you're trying to hurry with your luggage, you're going rushing through the airport. Years ago, I was on a missions trip uh, for three months, and we landed in Heathrow, and we were transferring, uh, and, and I had to get onto uh, a subway to get, uh, or a train to get to, from Heathrow to Gatwick, and I'm going through security, and I, my mom, bless her heart, God bless her, um, she, she thought it was necessary to, to pack all of my um, uh, um, uh, my laundry detergent, thank you, laundry detergent in bags, in clear bags. And so it went through the, the it was a carry-on that I had, and it went through the, the security and the x-ray machine, it came out, and all of a sudden I had about 10 officers surrounding me. Well, I'm clueless, I'm very naive, and I'm like, what's going on? And they say, could you step aside? And they took me to a back room and they said, sir, what is it that you're trying to, to, to deliver? What is it you're carrying? And I said, oh, that's just laundry detergent. <laughs> they said, uh, we're going to test it really quick, but if it comes back, we're going to do a cavity search. This is how naive and stupid I am. I said, well, I don't, I don't have any cavities right now. <laughs> If I'm lying, I'm dying. I'm like, serious. I'm like, and then when they told me what a cavity is, I said, no, 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 please, God, no. And I mean, and, 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 and I seriously, I'm so freaking out. My face is red. I'm speaking in tongues. Now they think I'm trying to, you know, give some kind of code or signal that I'm sending off. And, um, and, and so I went to that process. Obviously, they found out it was, in fact, laundry detergent. And so I had to run because my flight was taken off in the next, I mean, like 15 minutes. And, and then someone was, was seeing me run, and so they had a, 
uh, had a little, I don't know, like, like a golf cart, and they picked me up, and I barely made my flight, but I was carrying all this stuff with me. We carry things through life that weighs us down, and we, we, because of that, we, we, we miss our opportunity to go where God wants us to go because we're so weighed down. And, and what God is trying to teach and, and, and show Moses, it's not about you. But who am I, Moses said. And God never even said anything. Because it wasn't about Moses, it's about God. It's about not who you are, but who he is. Because, listen, if there's not a story and in, in, in a moment in here where, where God says, I'm, I'm going to lead you in a sinner's prayer, Moses. Now, I do believe Moses asked for forgiveness, but I want you to understand what's really important for us to know is once we've said that prayer, then there's a call to action. Because faith without works is... Yeah. So I, I'm convinced that God gave him grace. Moses responded to grace, and he was forgiven. And then God said, now, if you're really, really going to live this out, then you need to go to Egypt. Because salvation is, is an experience, an encounter with God, but then there's an action that's got to follow suit. In other words, we turn around and we live our life not for us anymore, but for God. Amen. And so... I want you to understand, it's not really about who you are, but who he is. And God says that you're the head, not the tail. You're above, not beneath. You're more than a conqueror through him who loves you. He formed you and shaped you in your mother's womb. God knows everything about you, but yet his grace is bigger than all your sins, your mistakes. And he wants to forgive you of those mistakes, but then you've got to go forward and act in action and follow after his, his plan. I want to, Acts chapter 7 kind of gives us some, some different insight, and it's Luke speaking. He said, Moses was 40 years old when he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites, and he saw them mistreated, uh, mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to their defense. Verse 25, Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. Moses was, a, was, was trying to make things happen on his own. And because of that, he messed it up. Have you ever felt like you messed up the plan of God? Come on, can we be real honest? How many of you ever felt like you messed up the plan of God? There was a teaching when I was a youth pastor going around that that God has a plan A, plan B, and plan C. I don't believe that. I believe all things work together together for the good of them they're called according to his purpose I believe that we can delay the plan of God their own you know choices mistakes and so forth but I believe God's plan even in our mistakes and our sin it always comes back for our good I, I believe that with all my heart and so even though Moses failed God and delayed his plan now he's 80 years old it, how many of you wished you would listen to God the first time yeah but God is gracious and he's long-suffering. So I want you to know you are not who people say that you are. You are not even who you say you are. You're who God says you are. Amen. And God simply says, you're forgiven. You're my beloved, and I want you to go now. Don't stay there. Go. Baggage. The second baggage I want to talk about is the word that Moses gives, suppose. Chapter 3 of verse 13 of Exodus. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers sent, you, uh, sent me to you. And they asked me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Everybody shout, Suppose. suppose. You know what suppose means? Suppose simply means to guess, think, or imagine something without absolute certainty. Suppose. And... and and I think a lot of times the believers, we suppose. And meaning that we're not all in. That we're just kind of going through the motions. And, and, and God's asking us to go. And we say things like, God, suppose that I go. Will everything work out? But see, that's not a life of faith. God doesn't want to suppose. He wants us to go 
all in. There's a book by Mark Batterson that our men are studying. It's a very good, very good book. I've read it two or three times through, but it's very, very good. And, and I want us to understand that Mark Batterson says, and I totally agree with this, some of these statements, that some of it's me, some of it's him. I just threw it in there. Halfway is no way to live. Quit holding back. Quit holding out. It's time to go all in and all out for God. The good news is if you don't hold out on God, then he won't hold out on you. If you give everything to follow Jesus, you'll receive amazing spiritual rewards. But this only comes as you go all in. Mark Batterson says, and I love this, this, this quote, when did we start believing that God wants to, to send us to safe places to do easy things? Jesus did not die to keep us safe. He died to make us dangerous. When was the last time you did something dangerous for the kingdom of God that pulled you out of your comfort zone and you thought, this sounds absurd, this sounds crazy, and it is crazy, and it is absurd, but I know I heard God, and I'm going to step out in faith. Moses went from a supposed, supposed God he became all in. Hebrews chapter 11, by faith, Moses, when he grown up, he refused to be known as a son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasure of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is impossible. So let's not suppose, let's let go of that bag and let's put on, God, I'm all in. Thirdly, the third bag that Moses dealt with was what if? Exodus chapter chapter 4 verse 1, Moses, God is telling him to go and Moses' response was, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and they say to me, the Lord did not appear to you? What if? And God says, what is that in your hand? And he said, it's a staff. God said, throw it down. And when he threw it down, it became a snake. God said, pick it up. Moses ran the other way. I'm not a snake person either. And, and he, God said, pick it up. He picked it up. It became a staff again. God said, this is a sign. I'm going to be with you. And he says, Moses, take your arm, take your hand, and I want you to place it in your coat. And Moses did, and he pulled it out, and it was leprosy all over his arm. God said, I want you to put it back in there, and then I want you to pull out it again. And it was just like it was before. There was no leprosy. God's showing him, I'm going to show you signs and give you revelations. Don't make it about what ifs. What ifs will drive you crazy. Listen, I've been there, done that. What ifs will mess with you. What if you're praying in vain? What if you're praying for your daughter that's never going to come to know Christ? What if you're, what if you're praying for your, for, your, for your grandson, your great-grandson, your, your family member that's homosexual? What if it never happens? Well, my, my response to that is, what if it does? We have to put our hope in Jesus. Your prayers are not in vain. God said, your hope will never be put to shame. So let's, let's, put our hope, let's quit asking and let's quit messing with this what if. What if? El Reno doesn't work. What if we don't make it? What if the church does this and have to go this direction? All these kinds of what ifs and hope. What ifs will rob you of your faith? What if? The biopsy comes back and it is cancer. Well, God will give you grace in that season. I'll never forget about nine years ago, Martha was having to have a hysterectomy, and they were going to do uh, just take her, her ovaries. And the doctor who attended our church comes out 15 minutes after the surgery began and said, Kevin, i got to tell you something. She said, I don't see how. First of all, if you told me you're, you're, you and Martha had three babies, she said, not in there. She said, because there's no way. She said, there's so many scars, so much scar tissue and all kinds of things. But she said, I'm very concerned. She said, you can tell Martha if you want. She said, I don't think I would. But when Martha was alert enough, I came, she came out. They closed her up. We were going to go skiing. Martha's, I said, what do you want to do? And she said, let's go skiing. But see, 
what ifs were playing on me. And for the first day, day and a half of that ski trip, I was messed up because I was thinking, what if? What if? What if? That you know God's not giving us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. The enemy wants you to concentrate on fear. He wants you to concentrate on uh, uh, worrying about the unknown. Well, what if this happens and what if that happens? That was Moses. What if they don't listen to me? What if? And what if? Well, you'll not have joy living in that, that mindset of what if? What if a marriage doesn't happen? What if it doesn't work out? What if, it, what if we still fight and we argue? Listen, seek God. Husband, you become the, the, the lead of your household. Be the husbandman, and you show your wife that you love Jesus first, and you love her second, and you put God first in everything. You're, it's going to be blessed. Amen. God's word is true. Let go of the baggage of what if. Number, number four, the baggage of excuses. Moses' excuse was, I can't speak. A stumble, a stutter. Did God tell you? And when God first called me to preach at 14 years old, I, many of you know this, I preached to cows for about a year and a half. And I got a call from, from a friend of a friend of my uncle, Boyce, who's passed on, went to, went to heaven many years ago. His name was Chris Armour. And Chris Armour, in fact, died two years ago. He called me, he said, Kevin, I, I just know I came from prayer time this morning. It's early in the morning. We're fixing to go to the farm and work. And he said, God told me to ask you to come hold my revival. And I just started crying. I was maybe almost 16. And I said, Chris, you got the wrong number. She said, he said, no, I didn't. He said, you're Kevin. And you know, I'd met him many times on the farm. He would come out and just hang out. He worked at a factory job in Fort Smith, Arkansas, just became a pastor of a church. Black gum, Pentecostal church, just north of Ion, in no, no, no man's land. Ain't nobody out there. And I was crying as I hung on the phone. My dad turned to me and he said, who was that and what did he say? And I said, that was Chris. And he said he wanted you to preach for him, didn't he? And I said, yep. He said, uh, what did you say? And I said, no. He said, Kevin, you need to hear from God before you. The next morning, almost the same time, he called me back and I said, you know what? Okay. I, I, I've told this before, but I probably preached for eight minutes and I cried seven. But there was, there was about eight, nine people that came to know the Lord. That week we had over 30 people come to know the Lord. Listen, I, you talk about hillbillies and rednecks. I'm like, goodness. I don't know where these people live. And they come out of nowhere about 6.30 and they have prayer meeting and they have church. And, and I felt like God is more concerned about your availability than your ability. God wants your heart. Quit giving God your excuses. Did you know that his biggest excuse was, like I said, he can't speak and he stumbled and he's, he was not a good orator or a speaker. But did you know actually Luke tells us in chapter 7 and verse 22, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptian and he was powerful in speech and action. You know why I believe that Moses believed he couldn't speak? It's because he messed up. He sinned. He felt like a failure because he had so much baggage. And that's what sin does to us. It robs us of our confidence. Because 1 John chapter 3 says like this, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, then we have confidence before God. So if our heart condemns us, in other words, there's conviction there, and we know we've not been living right, then we have no confidence with God. That's why some of you, you, it's hard for you when you pray because you're not in right relationship with God and you've got this baggage of addiction or you've got this baggage of, that's weighing you down. What I want you to know today, if you'll drop that, you'll start having confidence when you pray that God's going to hear and answer your prayers. Excuses. Quit listening and quit giving all the reasons to God why you can't do what he's asking you to do and the last baggage simply is telling God no conduct a quick experiment how many ever told God no raise your hand really honestly everybody in the building's hand had to be raised because I think we don't realize how often we do this 
Did you know that every morning that God wakes you up, and it's God that wakes you up, that there's an opportunity for you to spend time with God, whether it's at home or it's in the car, it's at the truck on the way to work, and when you don't spend time with God, you're telling God, no. When God deals with you about letting go of of baggage, of a hurt, of unforgiveness, and you tell God, you don't deal with it, you're actually telling God, no. This is what happens. Chapter 4, verse 11, the Lord said to him, okay, you're telling me that you can't speak. Who gave human beings their mouth? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, declares the Lord. Now go and I will help you speak and teach you what to say. Verse 13, this is what Moses says. Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. And verse 14 scares me to death. The Bible says, Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. If I'm really honest with you, I think I've made God mad a few times because I've told him no. When God, he loves you so much, when he asks you to give him your burden, when he asks you to give him your concerns and your cares, and when you don't give them to him, you're actually saying to God, no. I got this. I know what to do. I'm going to a doctor Tuesday. I'm going to give it to the doctor. But that doctor is called a practicing physician, but Jesus is called the great physician. Listen, I'm telling you, I'm speaking from my heart because God began to deal with me a couple of weeks ago. What I need to let go of that unforgiveness. I need to let go of um, my way of doing things. I'm a real control freak. And you know what? If your sons, if three of your sons get married in six months, you realize you don't have a lot of control. And, and I've learned my life and I are fine. In fact, empty nest is a, is a we have fun. I enjoy spending time with her, but, but God's been dealing with me. Hey, if you really want my blessings, let the baggage go. For those that say yes to God, there are blessings that come. Deuteronomy chapter 28 through 30 But for those who say no, there are curses that come. I want his blessings. So when God loves you enough to say, give me your addiction, give me your problem, give me your pain, say yes, don't say no. Man, if you're fighting a porn addiction and you've justified it for the umpteenth time quit saying no and say yes you know many years ago I was called about becoming a pastor here Martha and I were called and I'll never forget I I said no everything's cool church is growing and one Saturday morning Martha came out of her prayer closet and she said I really believe we need to go to Rome and I said, we're not going to Rome. She said, Paul wanted to go to a place where there was an ob- obvious, obviously larger audience to reach more people. And so I turned and I said, God, thank you for being patient with me when I said no. When I first heard the opportunity at El Reno, when I was, just became presbyter, a year later they came to me and said, you need to take this. And I said, no. Because I looked at their finances, and they'd brought in forty thousand dollars, and that was the biggest year they'd had in financially in a long, long time. Literally, I said no in my office. I said, God, because if we're going to grow that, we've got to. And did you know? In the last six months, we've brought in roughly three times what they brought in in a year.
we have going to have in Pastor Ben and Ada Gonzalez, we're going to have a full-time pastor. We've bought a lot of resources. My point is this. Quit saying no to God. He knows what's best for you. Start saying yes and quit saying no. There's an old song that I heard years ago. I love this simplicity of this song. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me with my whole heart, I agree. And my answer will be, yes, Lord, yes. It may not make sense on paper, but just simply say yes. Let go of the baggage. Here it is, God. Lots and lots of miracles in the Bible are tied to simply people letting go. Blind Bartimaeus cried out when he heard Jesus was passing by. And the Bible says, you know what he did? The first thing he let go was his mat. His mat was everything to a blind man because it represented he needed something from the people. But the Bible says he tossed his mat. He let it go. Because in his mind, he's thinking, I won't need that mat anymore. Because the healer is here. The 5,000 people that were fed with women and children, boys and girls, would have been somewhere around 20,000. One little boy had five loaves and two fish. Another story, there was 4,000. Not include the women and children. But in order to see the miracle, both little boys, maybe a little girl, I don't know, had to let go of what they had. Let go. Let go of your fear. Let go of your anxiety. Let go of your, your stress. Let go of your addiction. Let go of your problem. Let the baggage go. Father, thank you for your word today, and I thank you, Lord, for the promises that are yes and amen. God, I pray that on this, the second day of January, kind of different, snowy. You knew this day was going to be this day before this day was even formed. And God, you knew who would be here, who would be watching online. You knew everything about us. But God, there's some people that I, I know that in my spirit I heard from you. And God, there's some people that just need to let go of some baggage. So, so they can be free. God, we want to lay aside everything that does so easily beset us and run the races that's set before us. So, God, I pray for people in this place, first of all, who need you. They need forgiveness of sins. Maybe they've never accepted you as Lord and Savior, but today they're going to do that. Maybe they've known you before, but they've gone away from you. God, today they need to receive you. They need to ask forgiveness of sins. God, I pray that would happen in this place today. I believe it's going to happen. With heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. You need Jesus to forgive your sin. We're believing for a thousand people. We're believing for your life to be changed. If you need Jesus to forgive you, you got something between you and God. There's some baggage there. You picked up when you were a kid. You picked up when you were when you're in your 30s. Your I don't know, but God does. You need Jesus to forgive your sin. Would you raise your hand on the count of three? I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. I just want to pray with you right where you are. One, two. Three, raise that hand right where you are. I see your hands. I see your hands. I see the hand up in the riser. I see these hands in the middle. I see your hands. We want to help you. We want to love on you. We want you to know we're praying for you. Everybody, would you say this prayer with me? Just keep your hands up because I want people to be able to know who they're praying for. People that, our leadership, would you look around because I want people to, not to draw attention, but we want to pray for you. Everybody in the house, in the church, please say this. And even online, pray this prayer. We say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Please come into my heart and change my life. Through your blood and through your grace, I am changed right now. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's give Jesus a hand clap of praise. Amen. And these altars are going to be open today. I want everybody to stand with me. See, I don't think that I talk about it enough, but I want you to know some people here, you have baggage because someone hurt you. Someone wronged you. Quit carrying that. Let it go. Give it to Jesus. I, I just want us to be very transparent. I want us to be honest. Don't worry about the weather. God's got us. God's got this all. Thing. We're not going to hurry things along. We're going to come back to worship. Then Pastor Joel closes us at the very end. But let's just be real. Can we do that? See, the biggest, the biggest bag somebody carries around a lot is a bag of pride. Pride said, I got this. I don't need anybody. But let me tell you, if you keep carrying that bag of pride around, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Because pride always goes before a fall. Always. So I want to ask you, if you have some baggage, you say, Pastor, I, that's been very vulnerable. Yeah. But I want you to leave here free. I want 2024 to be different. I want you to know, hey, that's in the past. All things are passed away. Behold, all things be become new. And that's just be, some of your baggage may be caused some of what people have done. Maybe it's something you picked up and you just want free from it today. And I know it's a, just very straightforward, but I want you to have enough boldness on the count of three. I don't want this baggage anymore. Maybe it's a baggage in your marriage. You're just sick of it. Maybe it's your debt. I don't know what it is. You've got some baggage on the count of three. And if you want to bring your husband and wife with you, just come on. Your friend there with you on the count of three. You want some baggage. You're going to lay them down today in front of this altar, in front of this front. You're giving it to Jesus. Come on, we're going to let go of our pride. One, two, raise that hand. Three, right now, all over this place. There's some hands being raised. Come on, come to the front right now. Come on, don't wait. Don't delay. Come on, come on. Come on, if you raise your hand for salvation, come help. Come on, we're going to pray with you. Bring your husband, bring your wife. Come on, bring your friend, bring your neighbor. Come on, we're going to pray. We're going to seek God. When you get up here, there are going to be people around you, praying with you and for you. Come on, I need our prayer team. Come help us. Come on, we're going to pray for people. God's going to deliver. God's going to set free today. God's going to give victory today. Come on. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, and he's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time, and born of his spirit, and watched in his blood. Never fail. 